million infected in the U.S. Russia has overtaken China in confirmed cases. We Japan are pleading for residents to refrain from going out. We need to have an open COVID-19 vaccine. This is the end. We've been asking people to stay at home. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for today's exclusive live webinar, the first of our Hong Kong Foundation's Insight Forum series. My name is Pamela. I'm responsible for healthcare and social development research at the Public Policy Institute of our Hong Kong Foundation, and your MC for this event. A very well, warm welcome to all guests, members of our Hong Kong Foundation, friends from the media, and members of the public joining us through virtual means. A quick reminder to all that there will be a 30-minute question and answer session after today's sharing. We will be taking questions in written form in English or Chinese that will be randomly selected for discussion. Today, we're very honored to have with us Professor Ikeo, a renowned public health expert, to share his insights with us on the options for Hong Kong in maintaining control of COVID-19 while returning to a new normalcy. I'm sure many of us are very familiar with Professor Yeo and his dedication to making positive change to our healthcare system. So, without further ado, may I now invite Professor Ikeo onto the stage to share his thoughts with us. Professor Yeo, please. Eva, um, members of the foundation, uh, fellows of the foundation, uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great privilege for me uh, to be here this morning uh, to share with you some of my thoughts on our fortunate position now in Hong Kong that we can consider uh, lifting some of the restrictions uh, that we had for the last few months. And it has been at great socio-economic cost. So I'm sharing with you my insights from uh, the work I've been doing uh, on, on, uh, on this containing this COVID-19 in terms of uh, how we should be proceeding and the strategy and options and the roles of the um, uh, private sectors and civil society in terms of ensuring that uh, we will be COVID-19 free. Um, let me see. Yep. So when you look at the, this uh, geographical distribution of COVID, you can see that as of the 2nd of May, uh, we have over 3 million cases of uh, COVID-19 worldwide, and 229,000 deaths. And this just gives you a picture in terms of the concentration of cases in the various countries. And this gives you, as, a, as the number of cases, uh, in proportion to the population. So as you can see, and we all know that, that the biggest, greatest hit areas are in America, uh, Spain, Italy, England, and pretty much much of Europe. So the red bars are where there are great concentrations in proportion to the populations. You can see that, uh, you know, that there are cases obviously in, in many parts of the world now and practically no country in the world is uh, free from the, this uh, virus. And, but the ways have occurred from continent to continent and it's still evolving. Right? Because when you look at the, the light yellow ones, they are in Africa. Of course, Africa was practically the last continent to be affected but it's now uh, raging in, in pretty much of Africa. So no country in the world is, is safe. And as the pandemic uh, evolves, um, people are still uncertain uh, when it will end and if it will end. Th and the projections are that the, the conditions for elimination of this virus, as we did for SARS, the, the SARS virus was eliminated from human populations, but the projections now and the conditions for elimination of this virus uh, from human populations are not there. And it is increasingly apparent that it will continue to be circulate in the human population, maybe at low levels, because as you know that we have many people with asymptomatic infections. So it's pretty much like, uh, like a, a more deadly form of influenza. Between, uh, between seasons, uh, it will circulate very, very imperceptibly with the mild symptoms 
uh, and low levels in the community. And then you have resurgences at different se seasons. And the projections done by experts uh, are showing that there may be uh, resurgences as late as 2024. So obviously, there are a lot of assumptions in that. So it means that our, our, our uh, measures need to anticipate any possible reintroduction and resurgence of, the, uh, of this virus. Right? Um, uh, are you showing the uh, slides? Yes. <laughs> the, maybe I think, wh why don't you just show the slides and don't show me in, on the screen so I can follow that <laughs> easier. Otherwise, I keep looking down here and up there. All right? So the, the evolving pandemic, which I talked about, you can see that although some countries seem to be plateauing, but obviously the control is not there, right? And I'll talk a bit more about that because when you hear many countries saying that the numbers have plateaued and they can relax their measures, which is, I think, a, a wrong strategy. And I think there'll be many, many problems that will emerge from that. Right? And these are the deaths. You can see that obviously the red ones are our famous uh, deaths in America. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, the president is, is uh, saying this is all everyone else's fault, else's fault except his own. And this gives you an idea about the, the deaths. Obviously, the, the top part are the number of cases worldwide. And, can, and the, you, can, you can see that the, the, um, the different, uh, in, in the different regions. And then the bottom one are the number of deaths. And the mortality obviously lacks the number of uh, cases that are reported because it usually takes a few weeks before people are treated and then uh, they don't survive. So there's a lag between the time that you have infections and the mortality. Right? And mortality is quite a big problem because every country in the world has a problem of adjusting the numbers. Remember Wuhan adjusted it? But similarly, UK is adjusting it because the UK initially did not include all the cases that died in nursing homes. Right? So, so I think it's because during the height of the crisis, it's quite difficult to determine who has died from, from the COVID or, or not, because you need to have reporting, you need to have testing. And if you don't test, you don't know what the person died of. So there are lots of issues related to mortality, and every country is, has that problem in terms of when you're in the midst of an outbreak, uh, obviously quite difficult to take tallies, especially for a big country like, like uh, China. Right? So I just want to talk about controls, right? So we talk about the number of cases and people saying they're plateauing, it's being controlled. This gives you the so-called uh, estimates of the effective reproduction number. Uh, some of you may be familiar with this, but many of the uh, lay audience may not. The reproductive number means that for each case, how many cases then uh, uh, does this person infect? So if it, if it infects more than one person, the reproductive number is more than one. So if it's more than one, obviously, you will never get uncontrolled because if one person infects two persons, then you have a multiple of that. So people try to at least get it below one. Right? So it means that one person might infect 0 0.5 on the average, uh, and then you have a chance of control. But the, but the reproductive number itself is, is necessary but insufficient. Right? So, so it must be below one. But because it's 0 0.5, uh, it doesn't mean that you, you have it under control. You have a chance of getting it controlled because it's inadequate on itself to use as an indicator of the degree of control. And this is quite important because when we go back later on, when we look at different countries coming in, the, the, the populations coming in, we need to understand the, the state of the, of, the, uh, of the epidemic in that country. And then what are the risks if we bring people in from those countries? So these indicators are going to be very important as we open up our borders, right? So the, the numbers, the reproductive numbers, but this is uh, necessary, but even then it's insufficient. You see that North America has, has uh, the reproduction numbers are, are still quite high, but, uh, but they're not as high as, as they were, uh, because, uh, you, it, because as you start controlling it, your, your, your spread then slows down. So it's a sign that the spread is slowing but it's not a sign that it's under control, all right? So in Hong Kong, uh, these are the cases. Um, I, I'll, the numbers that are, uh, the numbers are probable, discharged, hospitalized deaths, and it, it, you can see that it really reflects the population density, so no place is uh, so-called safe, because in certain countries, they look at the geographical distribution, and then they have uh, what, what they call the movement control orders to keep people moving from, from 
from geographical area to geographical area. It's quite useful to, to look because these geographical uh, tables give it an idea where the concentrations are. And if there are unusual concentrations in certain areas, uh, maybe you should then, uh, then quarantine that, that community. But of course, in Hong Kong, uh, that doesn't uh, necessarily apply. And these are the total number of uh, cumulated and probable cases. Um, you can see that the numbers of, of people uh, who are uh, hospitalized is falling, the blue one. The people who are discharged, the, ye the, the yellow ones, have gone up. So with time, obviously, many of our patients are uh, well. They, are, they leave hospital. And, and Hong Kong has been really very uh, successful and very effective in, in managing our patients. Uh, out of the over 1,400 cases, we only had four deaths. I think we still don't understand why there are these great variations uh, in terms of asymptomatic patients, the severity of the, of the illness, and why in many parts of Asia the deaths have been very low. And in, in Europe, in America, there have been very, very high mortality rates. And one of the postulates may be uh, that, uh, of course, the population is involved. Older people have a much higher mortality. But in, in much of Europe, many of the deaths occurred in younger people as well. Uh, so there's another, uh, uh, another postulate, maybe there are different strains and as the virus mutates, it becomes more aggressive, but those are all speculations. Uh, and one other speculation that, that has not been studied sufficiently is the so-called cross-immunity. Uh, cross because the, the coronavirus, there are five coronaviruses in humans, and, uh, uh, and two of them are circulating widely in the community. And these two coronaviruses call mild symptoms like common cold. And there, there is some cross-reactivity between the, these coronaviruses. So it may be, there may be, it may be a speculation that, that maybe we have a lot of these other coronaviruses in our Asian populations where there's cross-protection between the different viruses. Right? So there's cr cross-protection because there are three of these, these, three of these coronaviruses are widely circulating in the, in the population. And the other two coronaviruses are now eliminated. It's uh, the so-called MERS and SARS. So and those have been eliminated. So we now have three coronaviruses that may cross-react in terms of both for testing and for immunity. So you can see this is quite important because in Hong Kong, we have a lot of very detailed data. So in the blue are the so-called imported cases. And this just shows you quite a bit. You can see that, uh, obviously, as we all know, the imported cases first. Then the imported cases lead to local cases. So we have local cases in red. And of course, we have also imported cases that then become the close contacts. But what I want you to look at is obviously the, um, uh, the yellow ones. The yellow areas are the ones where they're so-called possible local. So these are the so-called unlinked cases that we don't know where it came from. So these are the so community infections. So when we look in future in terms of the risk, we have to be very mindful that if there are these so-called uh, unlinked community cases, it means your control is inadequate, right? Because you cannot link them up. You don't know where they come from. So the, it's circulating the, in, in the population. And you can see that as a result of the, of the massive, the blue ones, we had, remember that we, we had the reintroduction of the cases when, when our uh, students and people came back from, from abroad. And then you then have a big numbers of these yellow cases, and they, they occur later. So there's a lag phase because it circulates in community and don't pick them up. Right? So, so one needs to be mindful, and that's why people talk about the incubation periods, and the Department of Health is very anxious every day. They tell you whether they're linked or unlinked cases. So if they're un unlinked cases, then you should be very alert that your controls are inadequate. Right? So I think that would be very important as we move on to look at the risks of other countries. But many countries do not report linked and unlinked because they do not do the same type of contract tracing that we do. Right? So because we have a good system of contract tracing, we know uh, numbers of linked and unlinked. And, but for our own selves, as we monitor later on, if we want to detect any resurgence, if we have any unlinked cases, then that would be some, uh, an, an indicator that we really should go back to uh, social distancing. Uh, so this gives you an idea. We looked at the, we, this are the, the scenarios that we did in our school, looking at uh, the number of cases and looking at the, the, uh, the imported, uh, the, the, the border controls. So we looked at entry ban from Hubei, quarantine from China, quarantine from all overseas, 
social distancing compulsory virus tested airport, and looked at the bottom would be the so-called reproductive numbers. So it gives you an idea, because normally it, the reproductive numbers are a reflection of, of something that occurred uh, two weeks before, right? because of the incubation period. It shows the, the duplication. So when you try to look at the, the correlation, you can see that these measures that we did reflect the reproductive numbers. So the control can be looked at in terms of matching your controls with the, with the, um, with the transmission, which is the reproductive numbers. So obviously, we, we use one as the indicator of uh, uh, when it becomes uh, clear that it's out of control. Right? So in the control of COVID-19, um, I'm mindful of the time. Uh, we have obviously important is the emergency response mechanism. Surveillance and testing is very important. So when it's early, so this when we look at this, obviously you may not be interested now because we are, it's after the fact. But the the past uh, will determine the future, right? Because when we look at surveillance and testing, when we want to prevent a resurgence, we must then put look in terms of what sort of surveillance and testing should be sensitive enough to, to, to detect any reintroduction. So in, in Hong Kong, and, uh, uh, we, we have so-called sentinel sites because we have got uh, sites in the primary care. Because when people are sick, when they have respiratory symptoms, the first thing they do is to go to their GP or to the GOPC. So you have these sites where you must then have people identifying first symptoms of respiratory illness and tests. Right? So Hong Kong was a bit slow in testing in these sites. Uh, in, in Singapore, in fact, they're very early uh, sentinel uh, sites and they tested. And they picked up quite a few cases. So those, because the first thing that people do, especially when they have mild symptoms, is to go and see a GP. By the time they're sick, it's already very late. By the time they have to be hospitalized, it's very late. So we need to have these sentinel sites to do surveillance uh, later on and make sure that we can pick up these things very early and because you don't know where it's going to come from. Your border controls are not going to be absolute. And increasingly, we are now trying to bring in more and more people to come in and we, because we can't shut our borders forever and, and, and economic life has got to continue. So we need to learn, see how we're going to manage this, uh, this, this, this uh, very uh, fortunate position we are in uh, to make sure that we continue to be COVID-free. So case detection and isolation is important. We isolate people when they are sick. Case finding, contract tracing. Hong Kong has a good contract tracing system. During SARS, in fact, we were so overswam. But contract tracing can be done only if you have, have manageable numbers. Imagine if you have 400,000 people with, or 100,000 people with, with, with in infections. You can't do contract tracing. Because normally with contract tracing, when they do a contract tracing, for each person that is infected, they usually, on the average, there are about 40 close contacts. And there's going to be about a, a few hundred other contacts. So you can imagine just the logistics of doing contract tracing and how can you quarantine 30 mi mi multiplied by 100,000 people. So the message is you've got to do it early, and then it becomes more manageable. So contract tracing and ice quarantine is very important. Uh, and then uh, looking at how we manage these cases. And of course, even the protocols for, quar for quarantine are important because increasingly we know that people may not may be, may be negative and then they may be positive again. So the protocols need to, to be reviewed uh, to ensure that there, there are no loopholes in the protocols when people leave. Control about the populations, I think we've talked about already. Personal protection, very important. So the, the, our, our really exemplary and exceptional uh, uh, accomplishments have been related to both government's leadership and efforts and also to the public's uh, uh, participation. Because the first thing that everyone did when there was this outbreak, you all wore masks. We, were, this, we couldn't buy sanitizers. So those were things that have been the ingrained in the Hong Kong population. But of course, with time, people forget. Uh, unfortunately, this time, or unfortunately, I mean, it, it's, uh, since SARS was 2003, uh, it's, it's uh, 16 years, uh, there's still memories because we're still alive, because I'm still alive even though I managed SARS. But of course, if later on, memories are quite short. And populations, younger populations, are not, not uh, as aware of this. So we need to then make sure that we can institutionalize this. So, so we talk about this, the new normalcy, right? So the personal protection is very important. Uh, and the, I'll talk a bit more about that. And environmental measures. So that's also important, right? Uh, and I'll discuss later. 
The other thing would be physical distancing or what people call social distancing. In fact, the preferred term is physical distancing because we do not want to be socially distanced. It, it's just physical distancing. And, and uh, last week I saw a newspaper cutting in the Morning Post of uh, children in school wearing these uh, song hats where you had these spikes and, and then you were one meter apart. So you keep people separately. So socially you interact, but physically you have these measures that keep you separate. And people also, when you have uh, large gatherings, draw areas, so you have one. Uh, and then, of course, when you do examination, you measure the distance. Uh, so those are things that need to be looked at. Risk communication is important for people to understand the risks. And then public engagement, uh, which uh, we could do more of always. S society and, and participation mobilization. So I think the societal uh, mobilization, uh, government did less of. Right? But I think because later on we need, in our review of our policies, uh, that's something that uh, perhaps one could look at. Because I think the, the private sector was not sufficiently mobilized to really play a, a greater role in the whole outbreak. Yeah. So it was very much the public sector uh, doing the things. So the, the key public health interventions for the public, there are four. All right? Obviously, the control of body movements I've talked about, personal protective measures, physical distancing, and environmental things. So at the, the restrictions, of entry points. Obviously, we need to have health declarations. Pre-entry testing is something that we need to explore in the future, right? So not just to come and, and wait. But obviously, there's going to be logistics. But of course, as you're increasing, as you have more and more people coming in, it's not going to be logistically possible to do all the testing uh, after they arrive, right? Already, you have t some difficulties. So pre-testing should be done. Government could work with other governments, as I think Singapore is already working with other governments, because Singapore, although they haven't controlled it, uh, are starting to look at how to ease uh, these measures and to look at how to open up the economy. Right? So, so I think it's their judgment what they want to do. And they're exploring with government to have uh, some common protocols and some understanding about uh, how to ensure that people that, that travel uh, are not infected. And then to have some mechanism to track people as they, as they, uh, as they, as they are in the country. So it is, I think pre-entry testing, to me, if we want to especially in the, in the early days, needs to be considered. Uh, whether it's with the governments or government could uh, accredit certain organizations or institutions. Uh, so if you want to come to Hong Kong, you could pre-test first and the government could designate certain, uh, maybe some private hospitals or private facilities uh, for you to do those tests uh, before you, you consider to, to come into Hong Kong. And then to also look at your, your health declarations. And at the entry point, you need to then review uh, whether you want to test again. I think it depends on the country. So one needs to look at the country risk to see the, pro the protocols and, and profiles for each of the different countries. And then whether you need to quarantine. But quarantine doesn't mean locking people together. You could, people quarantine now in hotels. It's all over the world. In fact, I suggest to the government they should do it. And they did it only quite late because they did it in, in, in Regal. Of course, the hotels themselves were not terribly keen. But to me, the hotels should have embraced this because many countries in the world, the hotels are so happy to do it. And then I was saying that, why don't you do it the, to the hotel industry? They say, oh, it will have a, a, a bad uh, image to our hotel. It, it's not. If you have good ventilation, good infection control procedures, it tells people that your, your, in, your infection control is excellent. And that and you sh people should go to those hotels, right? And, and because it, obviously there needs to be education and protection of the staff, and then for government to have a protocol where the people that go there are low risk, right? So I think you, you obviously the high risk ones, you quarantine now with, with these estates. So the, the, the triage in quarantine is also quite important because you can't put everyone in the camps. So you need to look at the risks and then the, the appropriate uh, places you quarantine people. Uh, and then obviously there needs to be some medical surveillance and some tracking of people when they come in, and I'll discuss it a bit later. Personal protection, right? So the four key things. Hand hygiene, the most important, right? So we're all very good now. We have all these sanitizers, and it should be available everywhere. It should be ubiquitous. Cough etiquette, right? this I'm sure no problem now. Face mask, when should we wear it? Are we going to wear it all the time? Uh, I think, it, 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 to me, it, we should be looking at the face masks are very important in terms of more protecting other people than yourself, right? 
So it's, it's good when there's a large outbreak is under control, we should all wear masks. But when it starts to be under control, I think certainly people who start to have symptoms, they should wear masks. Uh, when you're in crowded areas, uh, in, in especially in, the, in, uh, in mass transits, uh, one should wear masks. And if once, once you're in the mass gatherings when, and you can have physical distancing, it's prudent to wear it. Right? So I think certainly we need to look in terms of uh, when it would be desirable, because you can't continue to wear masks forever. Right? And uh, uh, personal protective equipment, this is more for, uh, for health staff. Ventilation, important. So we should be looking at our ventilation systems, right? So hotels, some hotels have independent ventilation systems. They're very good. So they're quite good for, for, um, for, for isolation. If we should not all our, in future universal designs, require independent ventilations for all hotels. It may cost more, yeah, but it would be quite, quite effective in preventing not just COVID-19, but all respiratory illnesses. So, so one should consider increasing as we move up our standards. What are the new normalcies, right? So do we expect that? Could Hong Kong not have really the, the best systems of ventilation and infection control in the world so that when people come to Hong Kong, they don't worry that after they leave, they've got these terrible respiratory illnesses. They don't know what's caused it. Right? And uh, uh, cleansing this infection of uh, surface objects and clothes. So disinfection of environments are so important, right? So it's not the mask. So when government is considering open up the, the, um, uh, the restaurants, the first thing I think they should do is to require the restaurants to have cleansing, right? So you should offer hand sanitizers, cleansing, sh no sharing of uh, uh, utensils, gong fai. Right? And of course, we need to have things that we can share our objects, minimal sharing. So uh, physical distancing, because it's very really physical, that we talk, not social. So we look at isolation and quarantine. Of course, the awareness of, of individuals. So we, we try to keep a bit further away from in, individuals, especially when suddenly someone coughs at you. But of course, now nobody has any symptoms. You don't cough anyway. Right? I, I think very, very, few, very few respiratory illnesses since the COVID-19 because we have, we have been so careful with uh, these infections. Populations, of course, we talk about that. Of course, ultimately, the, you can have these mandatory quarantines, of course, the population quarantines, the community quarantines are when you have lockdown. So that's the so-called lockdown, which are quarantines of populations. Of course, special populations are important. Uh, increasingly, uh, uh, the long-term care physician, Hong Kong, has been lucky. And of course, we, we were quite worried during SARS in 2003. So there are good infection control uh, policies. The outbreaks have occurred in many parts of Europe because they, I see that, because the many parts of Europe uh, have, uh, have have uh, have outbreaks in in long term care facilities. in America the first outbreak was in long term care facility uh, increasingly the risk there in 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 England in Europe pretty much Europe of course in Singapore had these problems with the migrant dormitories and then uh, prisons and mental health issues so these are all potential uh, risks uh, which fortunately we didn't have but we we once you have it then it becomes quite quite difficult control right? so the exit strategy. Obviously, in the control, we, I talked about the reproductive rate. When, when there are no unlinked cases and no linked clusters or so-called spring events. So the, the transmission would be no cases, then you have single cases, clusters of cases, widespread community infection. We are now at the fifth stage, which is when we are trying to contain it and recover. External threats, the pandemic control in, in globally, and looking at the country epidemic risk profile and control strategies. So when we then start opening, we should be quite discriminating to assess each country's risk profile and control strategies and consider our, our, the options in terms of how, how, how and when we bring these people in and under what conditions. Of course, social economic risks, what are essential services, our core economic activities, the social needs, the economic funders of our industry. So these are the priorities that government needs to look at. So we need to look at our priorities and the risks. Right, and then the new normalcy. Principles, intervention should be proportionate to the stage and level of transmission intensity risk. So if there's widespread community, obviously your interventions are going to be extreme. The stress should also preempt escalation to the next higher level of transmission. So even if you have single cases, we need to already preempt that it's going to break out in clusters or community outbreak. Right. So important to have risk planning. So we need to have what I, I presume government is now looking at risk assessment, uh, need to be structured that uh, way, trying to look for objective data, risk mitigation, 
obviously because when you move back to schools, there are me mechanisms to mitigate risk, like in when you're doing examinations, the distance, uh, hand sanitizers, perhaps a mask, but maybe not necessarily now. Uh, risk management, risk monitoring. So you need to plan for it. And then you need to implement, manage, and monitor it. So just because you plan for it doesn't mean it's going to happen. Right? So implementation always a problem. So exit strategies, look at the hierarchy, risk planning, to then when you monitor the effect, surveillance for signs of introduction and resurgence, and then you need to look at reinstatements of physical distance. So the reverse has got to go uh, in when, you, when you start managing it. Right? So for, for border controls, we need to, like the, as I said, the, we already talked about, pre-entry testing, conveyance, introduction standards, entry point, visit itinerary, duration, accredited accommodation perhaps, and then exit documentation. So you need to have a whole hierarchy to really track the person before they come and after they leave. So then you have uh, an ability to know what, where your source of infection has come, and then you're able then to, to prevent it. Right? So role of the private sector, so I'm almost at the end, uh, don't worry, uh, just a bit over time. The private sector are key stakeholders in containment. Very important, especially now, uh, more than ever. The workplace, to, to be physical distancing, working schedules, personal protection, and important environment measures. I think the public sector is already doing it. But really to institutionalize this, to really adjust. So Singapore is really talking about the new norm, where people may, more people work at home, better work schedules. Uh, and there are also a lot of technologies now that you don't really need to have on-site uh, uh, things. So I think we have learned, but how to institutionalize it. Businesses and industries. So I talk about the so-called integrated COVID-19 free experience of Hong Kong, all right? So people have new standards, and just now uh, uh, Dr. Kuo was saying that about the, the new service and products that they're producing for, for, for these new opportunities. And Hong Kong is very well known for our entrepreneurship. And, and, and with every crisis comes opportunities. So. Can we then not develop this? Because it's a chance for us to change the status quo. Because one of the pitfalls of, of, uh, of human beings is that we t tend to maintain the status quo. And it's only when there's a crisis that there's an opportunity to change things. So the new norm is, is what we should be moving towards. I was thinking about this integrated COVID-19 free because uh, when, when you start opening up, I, I don't know why Cathay Pacific never, never looked at the possibility, because I said that maybe the new norm should be all our air flights should be at least business class seating. <laughs> so, so people pay more. So you, you have these sort of alternates. alternates. You, you can have uh, integrated, vertically integrated service. So you have, you have people, you, you have a pre-test working with government. Before you come, you are COVID free. Then when you embark on the plane, because all, everyone has been pre-tested, you have, you have good distancing, and you have got good environmental hygiene, good uh, 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 prevention control on the plane, and then you then move down, and your conveyances are, are also protected. Then you go to hotels which are accredited, and then you have your, your retail industries, your, your um, uh, restaurants, are all uh, COVID-free accredited by the government right? <laughs> or by the industry. Wouldn't that be, be great? I mean, you, you have, and then we, we need to have a lot of uh, public health people to help do the education. Of course, one of the problems we are going to sell because this is a, a conflict of interest. The School of Public Health and Primary Care is the only institution in Hong Kong that has a, has a, has a public health undergraduate degree. So we need many more of these people, right? Because we need to have public health workers. We don't just, because we cannot depend on doctors and nurses, we, they need to be all over the community. So we need to govern, uh, in fact, to get that school, uh, my predecessor and I, and the dean and the, uh, and the um, uh, uh, university, took two years before we convinced UGC to fund th th just 40 places in, in public health. Of course, and then people don't even appreciate this, this group of individuals. Uh, and, and, and I think I'm going to uh, advocate this to the government, that they should invest more in public health workers, people with a degree in public health, that can then work in the community, work with you all, uh, to really ensure that we, we, we have uh, good public health practices. Uh, so we, we need to collaborate. So I'm, I'm suggesting the government, in terms of when they're doing their, their, their exit strategies, they should collaborate in risk planning, management, monitoring and evaluation, and it should be with the industry. Because you are the ones that know what are the appropriate uh, things that need to be done, what can be done, what should be done, and what may be done. 
And of course, you can also be part of the, in, the, uh, uh, the enforcement as well. So you monitor, because it's in the interest of the industry to make sure that we have v very good standards to keep ourselves COVID free. So mass events is going to be uh, maybe the last thing that we need to consider. It needs to be planning, risk assessment, mitigation, management. Of course, we have to be very, very careful about these mass events because, as you know, from some of those globally, there were large outbreaks. Uh, and then Malaysia had this big problem because over 10,000 people in the religious ceremony and it spread all over the place. And, it, and Pakistan also had the same problem. So, so these are uh, high-risk areas that one needs to consider. Social responsibility, we need to support the voluntary and disadvantaged. So in our, in our measures, uh, when we started with the interventions, uh, very little uh, th thought went to thinking in terms of the impact on people who are vulnerable and disadvantaged. Of course, this is now a problem in many parts of the world, and it's increasingly clear that governments, because you need to prepare for it. It's not something, when government is, is uh, gao gun for, you're not going to think of all these things. Your, your main focus would be just trying to contain the infection. So the, the social mobilize is so important. So all these should be, so we have this luxury now that we can replan again. So the, the preparedness pre plans, pre, the preparedness plans out for outbreaks should build in this social mobilizing upfront uh, before it happens. So the role of civil society, social mobilization, uh, communication participation, risk communication, sustained preventive mitigate behaviors, social service continuity, uh, mitigation of social economic impacts. Um, so I, I end here. I'm sorry, a bit uh, ran over time.